Warning, the cards you are about to see were used by professionals and or under the supervision of professionals. Accordingly, Purple Pineapple Television and its producers insist that you do not attempt to activate or recreate the effects shown in this episode at any time. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Let's do a little thought experiment. When I say the words Pro League in regards to Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Well, if you said any of the names Mathematica, Maitre D, Elroy Prescott, Howard X. Miller, Mr. Stein, or Orlando, then you'd be in the minority because these are the most forgettable professionals ever. The concept of professional dueling and moreover elite duelists that compete in some form of pro circuit wasn't anything exclusive or even new to Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. It may not be exactly the same idea, but I think back to Weevil Underwood, Bandit Keith, and Rex Raptor in the DM era were touted as globally recognized elite duelists. We just didn't quite yet have the title of the Pro Leagues, but I believe that that's where the idea started, and GX just expanded on it pretty constantly too, because there are several characters, such as some of our aforementioned names, having been introduced as only a professional duelist with nothing else substantial to their character. There were more important characters like Zane transitioning into the Pro League from Duel Academy, while Astro Phoenix pulled an Uno Reverse card doing the exact opposite. And then there were duelists like Mr. Stein and Orlando who were pro duelists, but that wasn't the entire basis of their character. Nonetheless, the label of being a professional duelist means absolutely nothing. Nobody cares. And when you lose more on-screen duels than you win, I'm even less inclined to believe that you're any good at this game. But it makes for a perfect episode theme, so if you're not a pro at putting together content clues, this week we'll be looking at the anime exclusive cards from the supposed Pro League duelists. Starting with Mathematica, not only because he has the fewest cards, but because he was also the most annoying of this bunch, and it's in my best interest to get him done as quickly as possible. Let's do that. Transistor the Warrior is a level 3 earth machine effect monster with 1000 attack and defense. And on a soft once per turn, during your main phase 1 only, you can tribute one other monster you control. If you do, this card can attack your opponent directly this turn. Off to a slow start here, and not solely due to the fact that this effect came straight out of 2004, it's certainly not bad, and I'd like to imagine that you'd pair this with monsters that want to be tributed to get their effect off. Not that we have a surplus of monsters like that to choose from, but you get the point. The effect's activation window being restricted to main phase 1 is a major detriment to the card as a whole. You'd be able to make a heck of a lot more use of a mediocre effect like this if it were a quick effect, meaning you could tribute a monster that's already attacked for the turn and potentially close out a game with Transistor's direct attack. How likely would that be? Well, not very, I can assure you of that, but at least we'd be prepared for when the situation does come up. What I wasn't prepared for is getting into some illegal activity, at least that's what the next card's name would imply, but the only thing illegal about it is that it would be banned pretty quickly in the physical game. Mathematica's only other card, Illegal Summon, a continuous spell card that on a soft once per turn makes both players special summon one level 4 or lower monster from their deck to their opponent's side of the field. You're probably questioning my idea that a card like this would be banned if we saw it in the physical TCG. I might be overstating its power, but a soft once per turn get a free level 4 or lower monster to your field effect is crazy. It's not a token, but an actual bona fide monster card. And while some of you might be saying that it's perfectly balanced because you also have to give your opponent a monster, I could see where you're coming from, if my opponent could also use this effect, like how both players can use the effect of chicken game. But as is, I can give them whatever low level monster that I don't need for the turn, get one of theirs, benefit from the free material for an extra deck monster, then wipe out the monster I gave them. See where I'm going with this? It's you, as the controller of Illegal Summon, that primarily gains any actual benefit from this card's effect. Don't even get me started on if you give them a monster with a floating effect. I'm telling you, ban this card before it even hits the production line. I might have spoken too soon when it comes to how much I dislike the Pro League Duelist because the next character, Maitre D, is just as bad if not worse than Mathematica but for completely different reasons. To be fair, maybe it's just the gimmick of personalities amongst these duelists but come on, pro wrestlers feel more authentic by comparison. Nonetheless, Pierre over here has 5 anime exclusives in his Wine and Dine focused deck starting with Docus the Busy Beauty. Sorry, that's the dyslexia talking. 
Bacchus, the dizzy deity, is a level 4 water fairy effect monster with 1600 attack and defense, and during each of your standby phases, this card gains 300 attack. Riveting. Clearly a GX era effect, as this is not going to work anywhere else. Frankly, I'm not even confident that it would have worked then either. Water fairy monsters aren't the most abundant in this game, even looking at the modern card pool, so what support does this have? It's mainly generic water and generic fairy support, none of which work in tandem with one another. So adding Bacchus to either of the individual decks actively makes both worse. What else? Cloudians? You'd have to be more intoxicated than Bacchus to ever think that that would be a viable option. I'm thinking we need to sober up and make better choices. Bacchus Banquet may just have what we need. If not, I've got a group on for Golden Corral. It's a continuous spell card that can only be activated if you control a face-up Big Vintage Magna Mutton. Are you sure that's not the wrong name? Because that's, that's not the card that we just talked about. Okay, as long as you're sure. If an opponent's level 7 or lower monster declares an attack, your opponent takes any battle damage you would have taken from that attack. If you do not control a face-up big vintage Magna Mutton, destroy this card. Can't say that this card is the worst thing ever, because if your opponent doesn't have the means to destroy this card, then they either won't attack or tank some serious damage. We have plenty of cards that make your opponent take any battle damage that you would take, but they've never quite breached the gates of meta relevance. And Banquet is no exception, especially without any semblance of self-protection, on top of needing one specific card on the field to actually survive. Speaking of, Big Vintage Magna Mutton. That's certainly not a name that I'll be saying in full at any point in a game. So Mutton over here is a level 8 Water Aqua Effect monster with 2500 attack and 0 defense. And during each of your standby phases, this card gains 1000 attack. Great, so this card is just as useless as Bacchus. Actually, it's even worse. Let's run the statistics. Going on a completely raw game state, let's say we normal summon Bacchus and place Swords of Revealing Light that our opponent has no outs for. We now have 3 turns to boost Bacchus while we garner more bodies on field to tribute summon for mutton. Over those three turns, Bacchus gains a total of 900 attack due to its own effect, bringing it up to 2500. And on turn three, we are able to tribute summon mutton, who comes out swinging equal to Bacchus. And finally, on turn four, congratulations for making it that far in a game of 2024 Yu-Gi-Oh! Bacchus ends on 2800 and mutton takes on its first boost at 3500. So while mutton without question was going to end up with a higher attack value, the tribulation we had to go through to get this mangy mutt on the field have severely underdelivered on their return. Some of you probably have some snarky remarks saying that basing this on prehistoric Yu-Gi-Oh isn't fair when we have more than enough cards now to turbo out a level 8 water aqua beat stick. Fair enough, and while I'd love to humor you in this endeavor, I'm also going to assume that those particular cards, which I will not be bothered to look through, could also turbo out a much better level 8 water aqua monster. But you know what's crazy? Level 8 water aqua monsters are among the least represented in monster configuration that this game has to offer, and all of them are just as terrible. Surely it can't get any worse than that. Foaming Beauty is a level 4 light aqua effect monster with 1200 attack and defense, with a flip effect that targets one face-up monster and decreases its attack by 1000. I'd rather take my chances with Slife for the Sky Dragon if I'm that dead set on decreasing the attack values of my opponent's monsters. At least then I get the added benefit of destroying those monsters without really doing anything. This is fine for what it is and is leagues better than Francois's previous two monsters, but it has no place in any modern strategy focusing on flip effects. The worst of this card's many flawed aspects is its light attribute, and mainly because it doesn't work with Jean-Pierre's final anime card. Divine Chalice, a quick play spell card that can only be activated if you control a face-up water monster. Special summon one crimson token. Aqua type, water, level 3, 1000 attack and defense. This card might as well be ban worthy compared to everything else in his deck, especially when looking at our extra deck options, not even strictly tier 1 competitors. This card doesn't have to be tied to water decks only. The attributes of extra deck monsters don't tend to make a whole lot of sense in regards to their attribute and typing, unless they're connected to a specific archetype. So you could very well find a water monster to put in your extra deck that would make Divine Chalice live for a free token. Being a non once per turn type of card opens up even more extending and I'm sure that that power is only amplified should you choose to run it in a water based deck. Atlanteans and Mermails are getting support soon, seems like a perfect opportunity to release this card but that makes too much sense for Konami. 
Well, Jean-Philippe over here just barely got one card right. Everything else was apparently a drunken mistake. Hell, I'm about to throw away my sobriety after having to read these cards. But the next series of cards though, played by Mr. Stein, should fare a lot better because they actually function as a cohesive unit. No archetype is complete without their own signature starter. So let's start with Scab Scar Knight, a level 4 dark warrior effect monster with zero attack and defense. And this thing has a grocery list of effects. You can only control one Scab Scar Knight. Your opponent's monsters must attack this card if able. This face-up attack position card cannot be destroyed by battle. If this card battles an opponent's monster, place one scab counter on it at the end of the damage step. At the end of each battle phase, take control of all of your opponent's monsters with scab counters. Negate card effects that increase life points. There is quite a bit to dissect here, but right off the bat, this is all around a fantastic card. My only negative on this card is the very first effect, because of how the second effect is worded stating that your opponent's monsters have to attack Scab Scar Knight if able, means that if you were able to control two, your opponent wouldn't be locked out from attacking entirely, unlike controlling two copies of Marauding Captain. So I feel as though the first effect really doesn't need to be there. But it's only up from here, brother. While tanking some damage, your opponent is forced to attack Scab with every monster, meaning a counter goes on each one which you are then able to take control of. And because this happens at the end of the battle phase, unless your opponent has something like super polymerization to get a few monsters off of their field before scab triggers, they lose everything. This really leaves them between a rock type monster and a hard place, seeing that super poly is rarely ever used on your own monsters. You almost always want to use it to get rid of your opponent's problematic monsters. And the piece de resistance, they said that the perfect counter to arrow mage doesn't exist. Will this effect ever come up? I have my doubts, but it's there if the situation arises. On top of these fantastic effects, it's a low level, low stat, dark warrior type monster, easily one of the most well supported denomination of monster cards in this entire game. I love this card, and we're off to a great start, but it doesn't exactly fit the traditional role of a starter card, so what else are we working with? Scab Blast is a normal spell card that can be activated if you control a monster with a scab counter. Inflict 200 damage to your opponent for each monster you control with a scab counter. If this card is in your graveyard, you can add it to your hand instead of conducting your normal draw during your draw phase. Oh, we're cooking with scabs now, baby. Finally. Some good fucking food. It's an identical clone to the card Magical Blast, which does what this card does, but accounts for the spellcaster monsters you control to inflict 200 damage for each. Might be a nice side deck option to pair with Scab Blast if Dark Magician ever becomes meta. Not that that will happen in the history of ever. Needless to say, I also like this card, and it meshing perfectly with Scab's control effect could make for a potent control in burn deck in 2024. Following that is Victim Barrier, a counter trap card which can only be activated in response to an opponent's monster declaring an attack. You change the attack target to another monster you control, and if the new attack target has a scab counter, place one scab counter on the attacking monster at the end of the damage step. No complaints here, we're making more use of Scab's control effect in a few different ways. Let's just say that you didn't use all of your newly acquired monsters for extra deck plays. You'll definitely have a new target to pick that has a Scab counter thanks to our Knight. Now we're mitigating some of that battle damage that we normally take from Scab being attacked. And one of two things will happen when redirecting that attack. One, your opponent loses their monster because our monster is stronger. Two, we lose our monster. No big deal, we got it as a freebie anyways. The opponent's monster gets a fancy new scab token, which we're able to take control of at the end of the battle phase because Scab Scar Knight doesn't have to be the one attacked or have placed the counter to activate its effect. Technically, there is a third option in which the attack values are equal and both monsters go bye-bye, but that wouldn't be our aim unless it is the only option. We just get to cycle through our opponent's monsters and use them as punching bags. Could have sworn that Mr. Stein was a political figure or something because we're caught causing a lot of conflict internally with our opponent's deck. Everything that we've hit in this scab archetype has been really solid, but most archetypes need more than just a level 4 monster and a few back row. How about an upgrade to our original scab scar knight? Let's go over both of the remaining cards so that we can better determine how they function with the rest of the archetype. Scab Scream is a normal trap card that can only be activated when a scab scar knight you control is attacked by a monster with 2000 or more attack. Destroy the attacking monster, then send the attacked Scab Scar Knight to the graveyard to special summon one Scar Knight from your hand or deck. 
The monster special summoned by Scream, Scar Knight, is a level 1 Dark Warrior effect monster with zero attack and defense, and this card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card cannot be special summoned except with Scab Scream. During your end phase, you can tribute this card to destroy all monsters on the field and inflict 500 damage to both players for each monster destroyed. So unfortunately, this is a major downgrade from the original Scab Scar Knight, and in my opinion, should be a last ditch effort or used to close out the game. Let's not be too negative about it, there is some merit to the effect. Like I said, closing out the game is fairly easy with an effect like this, because in most instances, after stealing your opponent's field with Scab, your opponent will attempt to stage a comeback and refill their own field. So, if you're able to put out Scar Knight, then you can clear a field of 8 to 12 monsters for a whopping 4,000 plus damage. While that's all good, I do also have to acknowledge that because you are probably taking considerable amounts of battle damage to keep Scab's effect going, Unless you have in-engine means of recovering those life points, it seems like more often than not, Scar will end the game in a draw, and no one likes that. A bad card? This is most certainly not. However, I'd be lying to say that this belongs anywhere but the side deck, and if a good matchup arises, then you play it. We do have one final card from Mr. Stein, which doesn't fall into the Scab archetype by name, but plays quite well with Scab Scar Knight. My main man. Well, actually it's Demand Man. A level 3 Dark Warrior effect monster with 800 attack and 0 defense. With the soft once per turn effect that can be activated during your opponent's main phase, you can select one defense position monster your opponent controls and change it to face up attack position. Demand Man over here is the greatest hype man to ever live, forcing your opponent's monsters to buy his buddy scabs, mixtape, and then milking a few features on your side of the field. Gotta love it. Granted, you're probably not going to see any of your opponent's monsters hit the field in defense position, or be switched for that matter, even when dealing with Scab Scar Knight, but once again, another great addition to keep in your back pocket, which I'd advise making space for before looking at Scar Knight and the trap card. Altogether, the Scab archetype is an interesting, compact engine that has more than enough generic support in today's card pool to see some experimentation and maybe turn out some good results in the competitive landscape. Now that the bar has been set a bit higher, higher, Howard X. Miller and his collection of nine anime exclusive cards have their work cut out for them. The lawyer turned pro duelist came armed and ready to lay down the brass tacks on you meta sheep. Monster Register is a continuous trap card carrying a 1000 life point activation cost. After activation, each time a monster is summoned, the controller of the summoned monster must send cards from the top of their deck to the graveyard equal to the level of the summoned monsters. Yikes, is this the new but slower max C challenge? Let's not get too crazy, this card would never be as potent as Max C, as there is no way to drop this in the same way that Max C can be dropped. You are completely reliant on setting this card, activating on your opponent's turn, then praying it stays there. If this card does stick around, holy crap, your opponent is about to have a less than fun time. This effect will mainly apply to main deck starter and combo extending monsters, all of which are generally low levels, we're talking 3 and 4, and the occasional mid to high level synchro, ranging from about 6 to 10. Yeah, that's going to add up very quickly. I do genuinely believe that finding this card in your opening hand going first could pose a serious threat to your opponent's ability to play their turn. It's not quite as easy as just passing the turn for your opponent though, at least not when buddied up, with Gachi Battle. Another continuous trap card that during each main phase 1 forces the turn player to special summon one level 4 or lower monster from their deck in face up attack position. And those monsters are destroyed during the end phase. On its own, definitely not the brightest idea to give your opponent free bodies, of which the majority of the ones in their main deck are able to turbo out one to three more. And destruction during the end phase is irrelevant because those monsters will long have since been used up for extra deck plays. In combination with the Monster Register card, you will still probably find yourself at a disadvantage for giving free shit to your opponent, however there's a better chance that they dump valuable assets into the grave because of Register's effect. So, I think the risk is about equal to the potential reward. But keep this risk in mind, because we can also capitalize on them building up their field from the free body. Making its way to the stand is Level Pod, a level 2 earth rock effect monster with 500 attack and defense, with one of the most insane flip effects that I've ever seen. When flipped face up, return all monsters on the field to the decks. Then, each player must draw cards equal to the combined levels of their returned monsters and reveal those cards. If a player doesn't draw one of their returned monsters, they must discard all cards they drew. Now, 
How often does a modern meta deck's end board consist of main deck monsters? I can tell you for an undeniable fact that it doesn't happen very often. Any extra deck monsters on the field will be returned to the extra deck, but if any of those monsters are synchros or fusions, meaning they have a level, your opponent will still be forced to draw cards equal to their combined levels, which in most scenarios will total to about 10 or more cards on average. Because they can't draw a card that was returned to the extra deck, that is a guaranteed dump of 10 plus cards, which is still on the low end. Yeah, you all thought that Ghost Trick Skeleton, Needleworm, and the Jar cards were ridiculous, and even in the worst case scenario, all extra deck monsters are returned to the extra deck with no further cost to you. That sounds like a win-win situation. But I'm sure some of you that try to find the flaws in every card are pointing out the fact that if your opponent does manage to draw one of their returned cards, as unlikely as that is, they've been rewarded for their trouble with a replenished hand. A good lawyer is always prepared with an objection. Purse with a hole is a normal trap card that can only be activated while your opponent has six or more cards in their hand. Hmm, it's giving dust shoot. Proceed. Send random cards from their hand to the graveyard until they have five cards in their hand. For the rest of this turn, your opponent cannot play cards from their hand. The defense rests. Not only is this an immaculate follow-up to level pod, but perhaps the greatest going first card to ever grace our eyes. For those uninformed, welcome to the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! The player going second in a duel draws one card to start their turn, and in addition to their starting hand of five cards, that does add up to six cards. Generally speaking, discard one random card from your opponent's hand doesn't mean a whole lot because cards in the graveyard might as well be on the field with how many effects trigger when those cards touch what is supposed to be their final resting place. Nothing is sacred anymore. Disregarding that, this single discard has now rendered the rest of your opponent's hand unplayable. How long has Trap Dashu been banned? Ooh. 17 years? Well, at least they'll soon have some new company. This is dangerous. I'm sworn under oath to tell nothing but the truth, and truth be told, Howard's cards only continue to teeter the line of banworthy. Exhibit A being Soul Connection, a normal trap card that allows you to add one monster card from your deck to your hand. No level restriction, no stat specifications, no particular attribute or type. Just any monster in your deck, all at the painstaking cost of flipping a card face up. Another first turn heavy hitter, because now I can just add all of my hand traps. I don't even need to hard draw them. This is literally like having a fourth, fifth, and sixth copy of Ash Blossom, which worries me. Granted, it can also be ashed, but if it pleases the court, it's a non-once-per-turn effect. Not even a soft once-per-turn. So, if I open the three copies that I will be running, go ahead and ash the first one. I'd even be so kind as to remind you that you can chain Ash Blossom to Soul Connection. Because I'm an upstanding citizen who will inevitably turn to a life of crime when I go ahead and activate the second and third copy. Our opponent will probably be more prepared to counteract this card going into games two and three, as they'll side more back row destruction to hopefully take care of this. Little do they know that we also have a countermeasure that we want them to destroy this time around. Elegant Light Level 4, also a normal trap card, and when this card is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can special summon one level four or lower monster from your deck. So that Lightning Storm, or Harpy's Feather Duster now gave us three monsters for nothing. You see, I'm a big fan of comboing IP Mascarena into Underworld Goddess of the Close World on my opponent's turn, and a card like Elegant Level 4 just makes it that much easier for securing smaller materials from my board instead of using my larger extra deck monsters. That's only the tip of the iceberg, though. Foolish Burial Goods now reads Special Summon a Level 4 Lower Monster from the deck, so it's also a fantastic first turn option. There's overall a ton of versatility for this non-once-per-turn effect. Ace Phoenix over here knew that all too well, as evident with our next card. Recycle Barrier, a normal trap card that can only be activated if you would take battle damage. You take no battle damage this turn. Pause. Alright, we're getting into the battle trap territory. It's basically threatening Roar, so you better impress me. During your standby phase, if this card is in your graveyard, you can discard one trap card to add this card to your hand. Oh yeah. I like it. Self-recovery in a card effect is always appreciated, and of course, tying back to Elegant Level 4, we have the perfect trap card for discard fodder, not only returning barrier, but putting a new monster on board to start our turn. I really couldn't ask for much more, and this is one of our first examples that actually surpasses the predecessors of Waboku and Threatening Roar. I would say it ties with Mirror Force because they have two different applications. Looking back at some of the first cards from Howard X. Miller, you might recall that those cards were specifically continuous traps, whose effects you would much rather apply to only your opponent. Don't worry, we've got that covered as well. 
Trap Sluzer is a level 4 dark machine effect monster with 800 attack and 1300 defense. And while this card is in face up attack position, you are unaffected by the effects of continuous trap cards. Is it the greatest card in his catalog? By comparison, not really. In the bigger picture of Yu-Gi-Oh's massive pool of floodgate continuous trap cards, this is pretty great. Your anti-spell fragrance, imperial order, and royal decrees now only affect your opponent. The stats are a bit off for something like machine duplication, but the fact that it's a low level dark machine monster leads me to believe that Sluzer will be guilty of several degenerate strategies, should we ever see it in the physical game. I don't want to dive into those possibilities because I like being able to hold on to what remains remaining sanity I have left with this game, so we'll move right along to Phoenix Wright's final card. Super Guard, a continuous spell card that requires you to pay 500 life points during each of your standby phases to keep it on the field. While this card is face up on the field, monsters you control cannot be destroyed by battle and you must skip your battle phase. Great, now Sluzer can be protected, Level Pod can be reused if you're running Book of Moon and Book of Taiyu, as would be the case for any Jar monster or just Flip Effect monsters in general. If it wasn't obvious, Howard was running a hyper-aggressive Empty Jar strategy, minus the actual Jar, so- It's empty! Just like my soul! I could easily see Super Guard seeing some experimentation in a modern deck out build, which worries me greatly. So far, Howard X. Miller is the only character here that has proven why he holds the title of a professional duelist. His deck has the answer to just about every situation, but to no one's surprise, still lost to Elemental Hero Plot Armor, who we'll cover in a later episode. I'm still not at all convinced that being a pro league duelist has any bearing though. It's more so just a showboat title, the iPhone 16 of dueling prestige. If there is any character that knows all about showboating and putting on a performance, it would certainly be our next duelist, Orlando. I'm gonna cut right to the chase. The first three cards that I want to cover from Orlando are his three Kabuki stage field spell cards. An archetype having multiple field spells has rarely ever led to competitive success, just look at my beloved Triamids, there is typically one of the bunch that stands out as the objectively better option to run. In the case of the Kabuki stage cards, I'm not really sure which one that would be. Let's take a look. To preface, all three Kabuki stages share the effect that during your main phase you can send whatever Kabuki stage card is face up on your field spell card zone to activate another Kabuki stage field spell card from your deck, which can be another copy of itself, keep that in mind. First is Kabuki Stage Big Bridge, with the soft once per turn effect that if a monster is attacked, that monster's controller can special summon one level 4 or lower monster from their hand in face up attack position at the end of the damage step. The monster doesn't have to be destroyed, which is a positive for this card, other than that, pretty standard effect. It's good, but nothing to write home about. Kabuki Stage Cherry Blossom Mountain has the non once per turn effect that when a monster is normal or special summoned, change the monster to face up attack position. When a monster declares an attack, the attack target is chosen randomly. I'm not 100% sure if the battle position changing applies to monsters that are set, because this effect doesn't specify setting monsters as other effect text tends to do. If it does, this would be a fun trick in any flip effect focus strategy to get immediate benefit from those flip effects. The random attack targeting doesn't sound like a lot of fun though. And finally, Kabuki Stage The Rough Seas. Well, it has an effect, but tell me if you see anything missing. During each player's main phase 1, the turn player can add one level 5 or higher monster from their deck to their hand. Uh... Where the hell is the soft once per turn clause? You mean to tell me that I can just search all of my high level monsters for nothing? Even with a soft once per turn clause because of the shared effects of the Kabuki stage cards, you could still technically get three free searches by cycling through your three copies of the rough seas. So, which of these three cards is the absolute best? I think that Cherry Blossom Mountain is overall the least appealing choice unless you're running a very specific type of deck, which at that point you wouldn't run the other Kabuki stage cards anyways. The Rough Seas and Big Bridge are a curious comparison. If your deck isn't heavy on high level main deck monsters, the Rough Seas is all but useless to you. And while the special summon from Big Bridge is nice and all, there isn't much room left to take advantage of those free summons because your opponent will probably run over the tiny monsters anyways. If it were at the end of the battle phase, I'd cut it some slack, but as is, you're just barely protecting your life points. The Kabuki stages follow the exact same trend as every other archetype that has more than one field spell. That's to say that anything more than one field spell is too many. But do the rest of Orlando's cards make better use of this variety of effects? Yes and no. Battle Claw Fox is a level 4 dark warrior effect monster with 800 attack and 1200 defense. 
If this card battles an opponent's monster, destroy that monster during the end phase. Low level Dark Warrior. That's really good. The effect? Not so much. Not bad, but uninspired, as we've seen this exact effect replicated numerous times and also done much better. We are trying to determine if the Kabuki stage cards work alongside Orlando's cards, and this card clearly works best with Big Bridge, at least half of the time. If your opponent attacks Fox, they lose their attacking monster and we get a free monster. If we attack with Fox, we lose Fox, and the opponent loses their monster, then they get a free monster. In a game state where there is a massive monster that you could not otherwise get rid of, yes, attack with Fox. If you're not in that exact game state, don't even consider it. Let your opponent attack Fox, and you reap the benefits. That sounds like this monster is almost entirely useless. Your opponent isn't going to attack Fox knowing what comes after that. Fear not, where there is a will, there is a way. New Year Drum is an equipped spell card that when the equipped monster is selected as an attack target, lets you special summon one Battle Claw Fox from your deck and switch the attack target to that monster. Problem solved! If your opponent isn't going to attack the Fox you already have on the field, fine. Force them to attack a different one for the same result, which still nets you another monster from the hand thanks to Big Bridge. Next is Shizuka, the Heavenly Dancer, a level 3 light fairy effect monster with 300 attack and 600 defense. When this card is selected as an attack target by an opponent's monster, gain 600 life points. I guess we're still on the big bridge? Must be a really big bridge because it's taking forever to get to using a different field spell. What can I say about Shizuka? Life point gaining? Arrow Mage, I guess. I don't know why you'd opt for running this over Fox unless you specifically needed a low level light fairy monster for your deck, but then I'd have to question why big bridge is in your deck too. What are you even playing? Anyways. Yoshitsune the Goblin of Beauty is a level 4 Earth Warrior effect monster with 800 attack and defense. And when this card is selected as an attack target Bruh. by an opponent's monster with 1000 or more attack, Ooh, we're really spicing it up now, aren't we? Change this card to Defense Position. Once per turn, this face-up Defense Position card cannot be destroyed by battle. That's fine, you're at least guaranteed a new monster from Big Bridge and you survive an extra attack. But at this point, I'm praying that the bridge will just give out. I don't even remember what the other Kabuki stages did now. Hold on. Okay, the Rough Seas searches a level 5 or higher. Oh, I got one for that. Genghis Gone, the Emperor Dragon, is a level 8 Dark Dragon effect monster with 2800 attack and 2300 defense. And when this card is destroyed by a card effect, select one monster in your opponent's graveyard and inflict damage to your opponent equal to its attack. I mean, I said I had one that worked with the Rough Seas, but at no time did I say it was fantastic. This kind of reminds me of the ancient dragon that was played by Grandpa Moto. A whole lot of build-up for a whole lot of nothing. Big Bridge has well more going for it than the Rough Seas, but we have a few more cards from Orlando that could turn the tides in Sea's favor. Ha! See what I did there? No? Okay. Monk Halberd is an equip spell card that can only be equipped to a warrior type monster. If the equipped monster would be destroyed by battle, destroy this card instead. When this card is destroyed by this effect, inflict 500 damage to your opponent. Not too crazy about the one turn boost on an equip spell card, really defeats the purpose of it staying on the field. Other than that, I like it. I used to love the card Black Pendant. Monk Halberd is basically Black Pendant, but driven towards Warrior Monsters. And one of my favorite structure decks was Warrior's Triumph, so this is the best of every world for me. It doesn't really help either of the field spells, not as though there's much ability to salvage them anyways. Dramatic Pose is a normal spell card, and when activated, you target one face-up monster your opponent controls. Until the end phase, it loses 500 attack, and all face-up monsters you control gain 500 attack. If I had to pick one of the field spells, the Rough Seas works best alongside dramatic pose, but only on a technicality. With Big Bridge, the 500 attack boost doesn't amount for much when your opponent gets to summon new monsters off of your own field spell. I vouch for the Rough Seas only because it deals with presumably big monsters and we're just making them a bit bigger. And Orlando's final card really doesn't work with either of them, so now I'm just going to say that Cherry Blossom Mountain is the best Kabuki stage. Thousand Strings is a normal trap card that can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack. Negate the attack, the attack of all face-up monsters on the field becomes zero. Basically a Woboku or Threatening Roar, however, I absolutely have to give credit for how Thousand Strings pulls off the effect by dropping all monsters to zero. That's very unique when compared to the flaccid reduce all battle damage effects that the other battle traps have. They may not do much right, but the pros at least know how to do battle traps, and I can appreciate that. And that was the final card for this week's episode, so now we can really break down where these... What is that? 
Yeah, I can hear that they're trumpets, but where, where are they coming from? Well, I'm asking you, turn it down, it's too loud, and they, they can't hear me talk now. Greetings, subjects! Oh yeah, how could I forget Prince Ojin? Frankly, how could anyone remember him? His Majesty has four anime-exclusive cards that we'll need to cover since he was in fact a duelist in the professional league. So let's see what royalty looks like in card form. Satellite Base is a level 4 light machine effect monster with zero attack and defense, and this card cannot be destroyed by battle with a level 5 or higher monster. During each of your end phases, this card gains 1000 defense. If an opponent's monster attacks this card, this card's defense becomes zero after damage calculation. Anytime I see cards with any kind of resistance to specific levels or a range of levels, I have to remind myself that this is well before Xyz and Lynx. Also, that I can't be too harsh when applying it to a modern format. It actually isn't too difficult with Satellite Base, but that is strictly on the virtue of it being a light machine monster with a decent level that is also a machine duplication target. I could care less about what it does, and no one else cares either because it's leaving the field for some extra deck nonsense quicker than it hit the field. It's good, but only for what it be as opposed to what it is, if that makes any sense. But the base model always leaves room for improvement. Some of you might remember Satellite Cannon, also played by the Prince, which debuted in the Championship Pack of 2006. But for almost 20 years, we've been missing out on the ultimate machine form of this classic monster card. That being Satellite Laser Balsam, a level 8 light machine fusion effect monster with zero attack and 2,000 defense. Requiring the fusion of three satellite cannons for its fusion summon, and during each of your end phases, this card gains 3,000 attack. If this card attacks, its attack is reduced to zero after damage calculation, and it inflicts piercing battle damage. Satellite Eye's ultimate dragon over here stands out amongst the iconic mass fusion monsters of its time for all of the wrong reasons. The summoning condition isn't much of a hassle because Cannon is also a machine duplication target, but Balsam can attack the turn it's summoned because the first and subsequent boosts don't occur until the end phase. Then resets when you decide to use those numbers, all for the most insignificant piercing damage. It's an amalgamation of nearly everything wrong with early fusion boss monsters, but just barely comes out as a serviceable card when played next to those same monsters. I really don't like this one. But speaking of satellite cannon, the Prince has been holding out on some in-theme support specifically for that monster as well. A normal spell card called Charge, which increases the attack of all face-up satellite cannons you control by 2,000. It isn't very often that a non-fusion based spell card would be debated for play over polymerization, but I would 1000% play charge over polymerization. Charge makes controlling three satellite cannons leagues better than fusing into a single balsam. Not only because it's unaffected by cannon's effect that drops its attack back to zero after attacking, but it's also a non once per turn. One satellite cannon, one machine duplication, Two charge on an opponent's clear field is an extremely compact OTK engine that I'd like to see be made a reality. Polymerization becomes an even less appealing option with Ojin's final card. Debris Station, a normal trap card that can only be activated when a satellite cannon you control is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard. Send two satellite cannons from your side of the field or your hand to the graveyard and special summon one satellite laser balsam from your extra deck, which is treated as a fusion summon and that satellite laser balsam gains 3,000 attack. I wouldn't necessarily put all of my stock in this, but in a dedicated satellite deck, I can't say that this is a bad option. Especially after attacking with Cannon, whose attack is now back at zero, it's safe to assume that it will be destroyed by battle on the following turn. And having Debris Station is a great follow-up. Not that they need their head blown up anymore, but the royal family came through with an almost perfect set of cards. But that was the actual final card of this week's episode, and you know what that means. It's time for the patent pending Purple Pineapple Grading Scale, where I take the total number of cards covered in this week's episode and get a percentage based on the number of cards that I think should come to the physical game. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. Of the 37 cards in this week's episode, the Pro League Duelists get a 65%, with 24 cards that I think are worthy of a physical print. Well, the pros are now the closest we've seen to a passing grade, but almost passing is still a failure, which means everything that I said about the title of a professional duelist, meaning absolutely nothing, stands even firmer now. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big...
thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below. If you missed the previous episodes, you can check them out in the playlist down right here in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1, where we covered every anime-exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check that out in the playlist right up here. Thanks again, as always, guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.